You've tuned in to When Your Mind Becomes the Scene of the Crime podcast. I'm Dr. Linda F. Williams. I take survivors of abuse and trauma from pain to purpose so that you take back your power, tap into the truth of who you are, and live your best life now. Back in the early 90s when my ex got out of prison, he came to Michigan to live and he was part of the prison fellowship program. And in the program, they assign you a mentor and he had a really good mentor. Knowing the challenges that they have when they come out of prison, even with a good family support system, there are certain financial challenges that you pretty much have to overcome by by getting a steady income. And most employers don't wanna employ ex-offenders. So what his mentor did was he loaned him the money to get a car. Have to have one. You're not going to get back and forth on the transit system real well in the early 90s in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So you had to pretty much have a car. And he was kind enough to facilitate him getting this car. It was a Ford, probably mid to late 80s model and it was a nice clean car but eventually it developed this challenge we would go out to start the car and the starter would just grind 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 and if you just kept trying it then you're burning out the starter so we bought two different starters at two different times in a couple of months and it was getting expensive and when you can't rely on when I turn the key I'm going to be able to go where I need to go, go it's a problem so this car would put us down in the strangest places you just didn't know when it was going to decide that it wanted to work or not well he picked me up from work one day and we had to go over to the kitty corner from where I worked, there was a gas station. And we went over there to get some gas or something and couldn't start the car. So because we were over there in the way of anybody that wanted to fill up at that pump, that then he, my, my husband pushed the car up into a parking space and got out, out of the way of the pumps. And he's sitting there seething. We're thinking, oh my goodness, now we got to pay for a toll. Who are we going to get to replace this starter again? It was just, he was not in the best of moods. So he cracks the window. Pretty soon this guy walks up to him and asks him, so what's going on? I see you're having some car trouble. Well, then he, my ex-husband snapped at him because he didn't, you know, it's like, who are you? Sitting up, and I'm over here trying to figure out this mess. This car put me down again. And who are you? Well, it turns out that the guy wasn't even an employee. He wasn't there to fill up to get gas. He was there as a technician repairing the car wash. It had broken down, apparently. This guy was over there fixing it. Now, what led this guy to come over there and start asking us about the car I'll tell you later how, why that happened. So in spite of how ugly and bitey and snide and snappy my husband was, the guy said, oh, so you're having problems with the with the car. Yeah, when, you know, we told him the starter won't go and we've had to replace it a couple of times. So the guy asked him, well, man, let me look under the hood if you don't mind. Well, at least he could pull himself enough. You know, thinking the whole time, this guy, what? <laughs> we haven't been able to fix this, figure this out. And what is this guy going to do? So he went ahead. He popped the trunk. The guy went under the trunk. And this is what he did. Now, this is one of those old time cars. I don't know if they still have fans and fan belts still in the cars and everything. But this car had one. And the guy took the fan. He had to make sure we had the car off. He took the fan and jerked it counterclockwise. That ain't got nothing to do with the dead gun starter. And he told him, now hit the ignition. Bam! Started right up. Started right up. Who would think 
that going over there and jerking the fan counterclockwise would cause the starter to work. It just was the weirdest thing. And so we we thank the guy and so much and this is what he explained to us my uncle had a car i don't know if this uncle what should you say uncle my uncle had a car like this and he had the same problem and it turned out that there was something going on with the fan belt connected to the whatever it was and when we would jerk it counterclockwise then it would automatically start now, there are a couple of things that I want to tell you about this. First of all, the timing of us being there when this guy was over there fixing the car wash who had a car in the family like that and was the only person probably because our mechanic didn't know this. He didn't know this. The only person in the world who would know that you need to take the fan counterclockwise so that it would catch whatever it was and start the car. Who would have thought that? I believe it was God that sent that guy to us. Now, we never had to buy another starter for that car because we knew get out the car, make sure it's off, <laughs> and we were good to go. But we would never have known that if my husband had just insisted on insulting the guy, putting the guy off, and the guy, he could have just walked away. And what would we have done? Been buying another freaking starter and staying frustrated because we never knew when the car would work or not. Now, what's the moral of this story? The moral of this story is that we as trauma survivors have no clue who God's going to send across our path to help us to work through a blind spot. You can consider the fact that we just kept buying starters instead of understanding that it was a fan and fan belt issue, that we were in a blind spot. We're looking at this situation. It's the starter that we keep burning out. It's the starter that keeps grinding. So the starter is the problem. We don't know what our problem is many times when we are traumatized. We don't know what kind of lies we're believing, belief systems we've developed that have entrenched themselves into us to the point where we think that they are who we are. We never know that, but here's the kicker, and, I, and, and, and this is coming to my Christian friends, everybody else gets something out of this too, is that when you're in church praying for God to show you yourself, for God to tell you why you didn't get that job. Why am I still filing this grievance? Why is it that I'm not getting along with this one? Why is this? Why is that? While you're asking those questions, guess what? When we work these kinks out and these blind spots out in our lives, we're going to do it 99% of the time in relationship with somebody. Now, I'm not talking about romantic relationship. If you're married, it could be in your marriage. If you're not, it could be with your significant other or whatever. You have relationships all over the place, professional, friendship, whatever. It's going to come in a relationship. And generally, you're going to be offended. Take a breath. You're going to be offended because the, the wisdom of God is going to come to you through somebody else. And trust me, it's not going to always be somebody you're willing to listen to. It could be that coworker that got on your last nerve. It's going to be somebody, but trust me, even if that person is benevolent and they have no problems with you and they are not trying to irritate you, you will be irritated when people touch on those areas in our lives that are fed by past trauma. It's going to be offensive to you. You're going to get the behind. How many times did I get the behind? Somebody telling me truth. Okay. And, 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 and you've got to be willing. If you want to grow, you've got to be willing to hear truth from other people. And you need to understand that just because that truth was offensive to you, it doesn't mean it's not the truth you need to listen to. Sit on that for a minute. How many times have I been offended? I had a boss that I came up. Okay, so, so I transferred from Chicago to Michigan 
after my husband went into prison in the 90s, okay? And so I came a little bit closer to where I grew up. I wasn't going back to where I grew up, but I came a little bit closer, right? And um, it turns out that to make that transfer, the people they were transferring me to didn't want me. This lady had had an intern over the summer that she wanted to hire this guy. So in order to position herself to hire him permanently, she started complaining about she needed more people. She needed more people. She needed more people. So she thought that th this was going to bring her the opportunity to hire this, this intern. What it wound up doing is putting her in a position where she could not turn down my transfer in there. In other words, it didn't happen the way he wants. She wanted to, but how do you tell your boss after months of you talk about you need more people, why you don't want to take this transfer from Chicago? So she wore her hands were were tied. So I came into a bad situation. Now I'm coming into this bad situation with a chip on my shoulder because she out in a New York minute. I all tore up from the floor up from trauma, not seeing how all of that's playing into my relationship, how I'm coming off to other people. And one day she told me, Linda, you're unapproachable. And I got the behind about that. Okay. Now, was she correct? Yes, she was. Was she telling me truth? Yes, she was. I had to suck up that truth. That's what I call one of those shut up, suck it up, and listen up moments in my life. She told me you're unapproachable. Another thing, so so the whole thing she did was she just kept trying to set, set me up to fire me. Couldn't like, didn't like the way I dressed, didn't like the this, didn't like the that. Now the people, the, the, this is the setup though. The pe people that she was telling all this crap to were people who knew me from Chicago and liked me. I had developed relationships with these people right up through the regional administrator who would have to approve her firing me, right? And so nothing I did was right, but everything she was feeding these people wasn't sounding like the Linda that they knew. So God had my back there. But I mean, one day she called me in the office to tell me that some girl, some intern on the job there said that I wouldn't say hello in the morning when I walked in the office. Now, but when I was back then, I don't give a rip. Really? Am I getting paid for her, her to keep her from getting her feelings hurt? Maybe I didn't hear her. If I hear her, I'm sure I would have said good morning. So really, are you calling me on the carpet and into a meeting because some intern said that they feelings are hurt? I ain't proud of the fact that I just cussed everybody out. She was bouncing off the wall. And then I went out there and got the girl who was bitching and complaining. And I brought her into the meeting. What's this? I don't owe you anything. I owe you civility and doing my job. Now, I handled that all the way wrong, y'all, but they were telling me truth. I would come in there so wound up that you could just sense it. It would be like uh, the, 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 the negativity was just flying off of me. And at that point, I didn't know how to talk kindly to peop people. If I was busy doing something, you was going to get snapped up if you came and interrupted me. But they were telling me truth. So when somebody comes to you and when you get the truth and you're offended, you owe it to yourself to think about what is the truth in the message. That's your part of that. Not how offended you are or how you don't like this person or how this person did you wrong or whatever the heck went on. The whole deal at that moment is, is there any truth in the message? Now, if they come to you all offendingly and came to you the wrong way and brought it wrong, you don't get to deal with that. If there's truth in the message, you deal with that truth first and ask for guidance as to when and how or if you ever get to call them on the carpet for whatever they did wrong to you or how they brought you that. But your main focus should always be, is there any truth in this message? Not how it came to you, whether it was delivered right on a silver platter, but is there truth in the message? 
We were sitting there thinking it was the st starter. We had wasted money replacing multiple starters, and the whole time it was about a counterclockwise jerk on the fan. My my ex husband was all offended. Didn't want that guy. Who are you? <laughs> right? But thankfully, he got through that that being offended, irritated, whatever. And let the man talk to him, and we were able to drive home that day. And I don't think we bought another starter, as I said. So always seek the truth in the message, because it's that truth that will fr free you from the blind spots that are ruling your life. That's our problem. It's, I mean, if, if, if whatever these things are that drive our triggers, we're going to come up dancing in front of us like a freaking clown and say, it's me. I'm getting ready to trigger you. Oh, yeah. I'm the blind spot. I'm the, ain't, they ain't doing that. They ain't doing that. So it's going to come through other people. It's going to come through relationship. It may offend you, but shut up, suck it up and listen up. Deal with the truth and the message. And you may or may not get a chance to call them or how they brought that. I'm Dr. Linda. Always remember your greatest power is realizing the truth of who you are. Know that truth. Thank you for joining me today on When Your Mind Becomes the Scene of the Crime Podcast. Schedule your free breakthrough session now at lindafwilliams.com. That's lindafwilliams.com.